and start the recording. As questions come up, feel free to put them in the chat, but also you can turn on your mics and ask them. Um, that is totally fine. Um, we just want to make sure that we are uh, turning off our mics after we finish, just in case we have background noise and whatever. Um, and there is construction sometimes happening around my building, and I'm so sorry if it gets noisy. Um, if there's something going on, let me know. I will switch audio uh, options so that we can hear me as clearly as possible. Um, but I think this should work for now. So thanks for joining me and fostering belonging in your class. Um, as I said a little bit ago, my name is Dr. Lindsay Reland. Y'all can call me, uh, excuse me, y'all can call me Lindsay. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the inclusive teaching coordinator at CITL. So in this workshop, we're going to um, work towards understanding the correlation between a sense of belonging and student engagement, academic performance, and overall well-being. We're going to explore effective strategies for fostering connections between educators and students and creating inclusive learning environments uh, that promote a sense of belonging. I am going to send you the recording, and if you would like the slides specifically, I would be happy to send those along to you. Great question. Um, and then we're also going to talk about techniques. You're welcome um, to integrate course materials and uh, implement activities that are going to promote connections among your students. And uh, as I said before we started recording, um, a big part about fostering belonging is feeling like you have these connections. So it's building community within the classroom as well as like on campus and, and in general. And you're part of the community and all of the members of uh, the class are part of the community, whether it's your TAs, whether it's uh, your students, peers, you're all part of this community. And so we wanna make sure that we're creating as many connections as possible um not everybody has to be uh you know the same right we have diversity in the classes uh not everybody is necessarily on the same degree track not everybody is necessarily um has the same responsibilities or identities but if we can all opt in to the class into uh valuing each other and valuing what um the course is going to do for all of us then we're going to create those connections and hopefully have these students turn up um, for themselves and for others. So I want to talk about belonging. This is something that um, I realized as I was pulling together resources for this presentation that uh, not everybody has a standard way of defining belonging. Um, and so I wanna make sure that we know what we're talking about. So it's not just sort of this vague, loosey goosey understanding of what it means to belong. So um, again, this comes from our peers on, or your students, peers on campus, but also our peers, uh, our, our classmates, faculty and staff, the larger community for the university. Um, and this is the way that we uh, feel included, recognized, like there are relationships that are important that uh, need maintenance, that are respectful um, and are supported throughout uh, the class, throughout coursework, uh through advising um and that means we understand what's important we understand people are important and that we are creating opportunities to demonstrate and recognize humanity um so much in the university system is uh is data and 
for a good reason, right? We have to uh, keep track of students in ways that make sense, that are uh, that can be collected, but we want to make sure that we also are recognizing the human beings behind that data and making sure that we understand um, DFWs are people, um, not just letters, not just numbers. Uh, transfers are people, um, and students that are struggling with specific things or aren't showing up to class, that they're people, not just numbers as well. And I'm assuming we all uh, are opting into that idea, but it, it you know, we're going to say it anyway. Um, so belonging is so important. Uh, some of you have already noted these things when you talked about why you're here today, but we know that there's a correlation between a sense of belonging and engagement, performance, and overall well-being. Um, and students often don't realize that it's normal uh, to feel like they don't fit in um, or to feel unsure of themselves academically. And uh, just because it's normal doesn't mean it's like, okay, obviously, doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to reach out to these students or shouldn't try to help them make these uh, connections with each other, uh, feel confident in themselves as people and within the, um, within the programs that we teach. Uh, but when they feel like this isn't common, uh, people are more likely to isolate and to feel like they can't accomplish their goals. And this is important too from um, just a university-wide standpoint. Uh, the WFDs um, or DFWs, however our your program talks about it and retention um, is all related to belonging. So if we have students that aren't feeling connected, they're more likely to withdraw, they're more likely to fail, and they're more likely to leave the university. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know statistically if it's uh, the same percentage for graduates as undergrads, we know that we are seeing this surge of undergrads uh, leave without um, completing degrees, but there is a high rate for graduate students, especially in PhD programs, to uh, not complete their degrees as well. Um, there's this high rate of ABDs in the humanities and um, I'm not sure how that data has changed since the pandemic, um, but we know that a lot of students in uh, the graduate program specifically leave grad programs without a degree because they are uh, dealing with a mental health crisis. Oh, ABD is all but doctorate. So they are leaving, having completed all of their coursework and any sort of qualifying exams without actually finishing a dissertation or a research project. Um, and uh, WFBs are withdrawals, fails, and uh, D-level grades. So essentially uh, anything lower than a C and uh, possibly having to retake the course. Great question. Of course. Continue to ask questions as they occur. Um, I love clarity. Um, so some of the things that we can do as we are thinking about creating belonging, um, and we're thinking about connecting with our students and creating um, opportunities for them to connect with each other. Um, in our class, 
we can create uh, social belonging messages. And I'm going to send out a resource to you uh, that'll take you through step by step on how to create these for your own classes and um, what they might do for your class. But essentially, a social belonging message is something that you would uh, share with your students early on in the semester. It might be the first day of class, it might be in the first two weeks of class, uh, but it's going to be about you and your sense of belonging. Um, so again, we're going to normalize those feelings of, I don't have a place here, um, and recognize that that's, uh, that's something that other people deal with, and um, create this sort of uh, opportunity to relate to one each other and for students to come to you and connect with you over this feeling. So in a, in a social belonging message, you might explain when you felt like you didn't belong in um, in the community, whether it's uh, the community of NIU, whether it's the university that you received or one of the universities that you received your degree from, um, academia, or even in your field. Um, when do you feel like an imposter? Um, and sort of address that even if you feel like you don't belong sometimes, you still belong and you still have this right to take up space and to pursue the things that you want. Another thing that you might do is uh, create what is called a, meaning, a meeting menu. Um, I'll also send out a resource about that after, uh, after we finish our chat today. Um, and a meeting menu essentially uh, gives you some options for how students might come talk to you. So if they want to uh, chat with you outside of your office, because maybe your office feels um, scary and hard to get to, and maybe that feels really, really formal. Um, maybe they uh, see you outside of Starbucks in the student center. Um, and thinking about options for students to come talk to you one on one. If they can create a connection with you and you can talk to them about why they should be in your class and why this is important and uh, and you can have this opportunity to relate to them, that's going to be huge. Um, and normalizing asking questions and taking up space for them too. If students feel like they're underprepared and they can't ask questions, they're less likely to be successful, but they're also less likely to feel like they should be in your class, right? If they feel like they're behind, if they feel like they can't manage the work, uh, they're just not going to be showing up. They're not going to be, uh, they're going to be self-conscious and just less likely to uh, be successful and in some cases to even try. So if we can make those connections early on, give students an opportunity to connect with you, um, that's great. Again, I'll send out resources about that that'll go in a little bit more depth of what that might look like for, um, for those meetings. Um, within your class, you might create shared uh, community agreements for behavior. Now, obviously, semester has started, um, so this might not be something that you can do this semester, although depending on what's happening in your classroom, it might be something that you would want to go back and revisit. Like, okay, we've been doing a lot of group work. Let's think about how we want to uh, spend our time together. What do we agree on that we should be doing in order to help each other out, in order uh, to standardize specific behavior? Um, so if you do this early on in the semester or even you know midterm when you start a big group project, uh, this is an opportunity for students to think about behavior and to think about what would actually uh, meet their needs, what's distracting behavior, or what's just been sort of like normalized as not being acceptable. So 
it might be something about, um, you know, whether or not students should be raising hands or just freely talking because your class is discussion based. Um, it might be whether or not they can have uh, talks about specific topics. It might be whether or not they can um, join the class if they're going to be late, stuff like that. So um, having those conversations and being open to students' uh, thoughts and feelings, a great way to start off the semester and, or again, it could be mid semester, but also sort of like reassess and demonstrate that you value their their voices and their opinions. And uh, that's a way to demonstrate that they belong in this classroom. Um, and then also communication. I think that this is probably uh, not super new and not super shocking to many of you, but if you can communicate frequently and as personally as possible, um, that's going to go a long way. Some of us teach very big classes. Um, some of us teach small classes, but if you have uh, 100 students a semester, that's still a lot of people to keep tabs on, right? Um, so make sure you're keeping notes. If you can keep, um, an Excel sheet, that's my favorite method with student information. Um, what do students prefer to be called? Uh, information about pronouns. If they uh, reveal information about, uh, oh, well, on Wednesdays, I have to take care of uh, this person. So sometimes I'm going to be late to class. Jot that down in a little document and keep that information for later. You can keep information about who has extensions, um, what's going on with them, reminders about when you need to check, check in with people, um, that sort of stuff. And for those of us that teach really big classes, we also might have TAs. Uh, and TAs should be part of this community building. And if they're able to then share documents like these Excel sheets with you, so everybody has an understanding of what student needs are, what students' identities are, and we can continue to have these conversations. That's pretty ideal. Oh, and I will say that those uh, documents are uh, private. <laughs> so it's not something that I would necessarily uh, you know, be sharing with anybody outside of uh, outside of TAs. Collecting information. So uh, that would be, um, so personally, I either have students email me in the first uh, week of class, or I'll have them do like a short, uh, a little blurb about themselves in, Blackboard, have them hand write something. Um, and I always ask for um, information on what they want to be called, um, pronouns, any needs um, that aren't necessarily something that would be covered by the Disability Resource Center, but just general like needs or things going on with them. So they might reveal that um, they have ADHD, they might reveal that they are uh, parents or they work full time, that sort of stuff. Um, and then I just uh, put that information into, you know, uh, a space that is not linked to uh, the learning management system. So you might collect those on Blackboard. That's an easy way of keeping that information all together. I do like um, having students email me personally because then I know that they have my email um, already in their in their Outlook. But if you're teaching classes of 100 students, that's going to be pretty uh, pretty sticky. Um, but you could also do something like a Qualtrics survey. Uh, you could do handouts where students print down this information. Um, 
and and hand things in. Um, that's just sort of how I've been collecting information. Um, but again, depending on the size of your classes, that might look differently for for you. Um, and if you have TAs, they could you know divide and conquer, so to speak. They might take you know twenty five students each and um, email with them, collect all the information there. Um, but yeah, so that's how I uh, think about that and and collect the information. And again, we're not necessarily uh, creating these sort of profiles to like um, do anything with this data outside of just understanding our students. Um, but it really helps when someone says, oh, I told you before this, you know, particular thing and you have some sort of records for it rather than um, trying to keep track of, you know, 15 different emails or whatever. And your notes can be uh, more specific uh, depending on what works best for your brain. Um, thinking about course materials and resources, um, we also want to think about how we are connecting our students to the course with uh, what we are actively doing in the classroom, but also what we're reading, what we're listening to, what we're viewing. Um, so we know that students are more likely to feel connected to topics if there's representation of people like them studying the things, talking about the things, whatever it is. Um, so you're not always going to hit every student's identity with the way that you collect information um, and resources for the class. That's not super realistic, right? Um, but thinking about how, uh, what resources you, you share, whether it's active like resources that are required for um or excuse me materials that are required readings or viewings or if it's just background information thinking about including voices and perspectives from diverse backgrounds um and again that might be primary or supplemental resources it might be guest speakers or even connecting course content to current events. Um, collect and share student success resources and normalize using them. So are there campus and community resources that would help students? Are there tutoring resources? Uh, are there people that you can ask from the University Writing Center or the Learning Center to come in and talk about their resources. Uh, that's all super, super helpful for students to actually see people that work in those spaces and students that have used those services. Um, they're going to feel more connected and more like they can use them themselves. Uh, I have in the email that I'm going to send out later, I'm going to have a link to those resources too. So those of you that aren't familiar with them, all that's coming your way. Um, and if you have uh, a course that you are teaching um, more, more than once or that you uh, know students who have taken it in the past, collect suggestions from previous students on what it means to be successful in that class. Uh, what can they do in order to connect to the topics? Uh, best ways to think about working on that group project, whatever it is. So demonstrating that there were students here before you, they were successful. These are the things that they did. Uh, they also were challenged at times, but they came out on top. Uh, that really helps set this precedent of, well, this is this is manageable. And again, we're in this together. We want to get through this together. Um, creating a sense of belonging. If you ask students to reflect and contextualize 
what's going on with the course, what's going on with the university, why are they there, what are they hoping to come away with. There are always going to be students that are just like, I'm here because I have to be. Um, this is the only course that fit my schedule. Uh, this is a required course, whatever it is. Um, and that's okay. That's, that's totally fine if somebody is in your class because they have to be. Uh, we still love them, right? We still appreciate them. They're still in the classroom. That's amazing. Um, hopefully they will be able to get some stuff out of it. And I think that knowing that uh, they're required to be in the classroom, but thinking about, okay, you're supposed to be here because this is a re university requirement, but what is your, uh, what's your degree track? How can we connect this to either uh, quote unquote real world experiences or connect it to your program? or connect it to your future, how can we contextualize this information to make sure that you understand it's important and that uh, it's important that you specifically understand it and you can take information away from this course. And then also acknowledge that identity matters. Um, create space for uh, students to recognize that um, they're coming in with these lived experiences and identities, and that matters. We talk a lot about being objective in research and in writing and um, in academia in general. And this idea that you aren't supposed to be biased, that you have to come in with this like neutral perspective, and that's just not going to happen, right? All of our past experiences and our identities are going to inform the way that we are encountering information and relationships. And so affirming that those identities matter and that uh, some of those experiences are going to make students uh, aware of connections that you might not be yourself and that's amazing um creating that space is is going to help students feel like they belong and they like they have something to contribute to class and some of this might be affirming lgbtq students uh and like currently recognizing the impact that that current events might have on on our muslim or jewish students uh, recognizing that, uh, for example, uh, Native American students might be interested in um, what's going on with the students on campus trying to get a uh, resource center together, things like that. Can you connect them to what's going on with uh, with campus and make those connections that way, but also can you affirm that yeah, some of these things might be weighing heavy on your mind right now, and and I understand that and I respect that. Um, creating space for them to uh, have human uh, emotions that aren't necessarily tied to our class, but are tied to the world beyond or the campus beyond. Um, and that that's acceptable is going to also create this, this sense of belonging um, that we don't have to be perfect every time we show up to class. Within our classrooms, we can um, incorporate activities that are going to promote uh, connection between peers. So if we, uh, if we are sharing our own belonging stories, as I uh, mentioned earlier within the first part of the semester, um, you might also have students create their own belonging stories. So why are they um, why are they here at NIU? Um, are there times when they feel like they don't fit in? Are there times that they this degree path wasn't appropriate for them or that uh, they didn't have what it takes? And this might be something that is 
maybe a little bit too deep or vulnerable for some of our classes. Um, for the writing class or for gender studies, the, the places that I come from, um, this is kind of standard. Um, but if you have, you know, 200 students in a chemistry class, uh, that might not, that might not work. Uh, but it's also a great opportunity for TAs or for graduate students to think about, uh, think about their own belonging and to create, uh, opportunities to share that, uh, because we need to make sure that uh, undergraduate students and graduate students recognize that we don't always feel like we belong. And uh, having those feelings are an opportunity for us to connect with each other and to build each other up. Um, we can also create uh, assignments that apply concepts to real life situations or interests. So if we are connecting the information from our course to students' particular interests outside of uh, what we're talking about in the classroom, that's great. Um, there might be specific classes where this is harder to do. Uh, the resources that I was looking at were talking about how um, for a course, they, the uh, instructor recognized that a lot of students were interested in sneaker culture. And so I think this was a physics class. They had their students design shoes that were cool and functional for Mars. Um, in a design course, students, uh, or excuse me, in an architecture course, I think it was, uh, students were asked to uh, design a building that incorporated their cultures and identities into the design. And it wasn't necessarily like an individual student saying, oh, I'm German, this is what's interesting to me. It was more of like, a, oh, what are the identities and backgrounds of everybody in the classroom? Here's some cool things. Let's think about how we can um, come together and incorporate these into a design. And so it's, a group project. It's acknowledging uh, people's individual identities and learning stuff about each other too. In ways that uh, might not be completely redesigning our assignments. Again, we're halfway through this. Well, not halfway through the semester. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. We're part of way through the semester um, and maybe can't overhaul all of our assignments right now, but what we can do is use groups and repeatedly use those groups. So um, I recommend using groups based off the location in the classroom. Um, if you don't have specific students that are assigned to a group already, it's the easiest way to get them to group together. Students tend to sit in the same spot over and over and over again, even when they're not required to. So they'll get to know the people that are sitting in their area and connect with them. Um, and if group work is not going so well, or if you're using it for the first time in the semester, you can create, uh, you can use community building activities before getting to uh, nitty gritty work. We want to make sure students are always sharing their names um, with each other because they tend to not do that um, unless you actively say, hey, make sure you share your names. If you make them turn in a, a sheet of paper with the group, they'll just, you know, send that paper around to everybody, have everybody who put their name on it and send it in without actually introducing themselves. So make sure you're having them introduce themselves and share names, remind each other. Um, and they can share information about like what programs they're in or other personal or silly stuff. Uh, some people create a barter board within um, groups. So it's the idea that students are going to be uh, working together and supporting each other and a way that they might do that is by bartering services. 
and resources. So it might be like, oh, hey, I'll bring um, apples if you want to schedule a, a, a study buddy group while we walk on um, on the treadmills at the uh, at the health center, whatever it is. Oh, I have access to this uh, space in the library. I'll rent this out if you bring um, this particular book. So what can they do in order to uh, work together to share resources and uh, create connections out of class? I don't know what a class delegate is. Can you explain that? I'm going to say no. Um, in some classes, they might have so you might have a, a graduate assistant that is uh, sort of helping in that way, but there is not a specific one student that is uh, collecting concerns and uh, talking to an instructor about that. Um, there might be specific people who have designed their courses that way, but that's not a given in, in um, classes, no. Um, but that is something that would uh, possibly be something to think about too. If we uh, design groups, are there uh, specific people willing to speak up for others when there's confusion or concerns? Um, Let me think. Okay. Um, sorry, I lost my spot on the page. Uh, thinking about creating opportunities for group work that benefits everyone. Um, I know that some people uh, hate group work. The idea that uh, it's going to slow them down, bog them down, that some people uh, don't do anything. There's a lot of uh, bad rap about group work. But I think students need to get used to working with other people because that's what happens um, in a lot of workplaces outside of the university. And also, we need to be able to uh, work on our communication skills and ask for help and clarification. And it helps to connect with other people when we're working through um, course content. So group work. Um, can be designed to benefit everyone within the group, but also within the class. So uh, getting students together to do group work where they are writing questions for the exams or quizzes. Um, after a unit, ask them, OK, what are three things that are really important takeaways from this unit that you would expect to see on an exam or a quiz? Um, asking them to then create uh, a question for an exam or a quiz about that, asking them to put together information for a study guide based off of that. OK, there's these three things. Um, where do you find more information about that? Can you uh, insert links here to the uh, readings or to find supplemental uh, materials on it through podcasts or YouTube videos or whatever? Um, so having them work together in those ways where it is low stakes in that they're not like getting graded for it, but it is going to benefit them and other people in the class uh, is a good way for everybody to be on board from the jump. Yes, we want to we want to do this group work. We want to get it done um, in a way that benefits us, but also other people. This is valuable. Um, and this is a good use of our time. Um, and encouraging or arranging study groups. Uh, we can't always make students show up for things outside of class. 
uh, that's just, you know, not realistic. But we can also uh, reserve spaces for them in the library in order for them to study. Uh, we can create spaces for them to sign up and exchange information with other people in the class, even if they don't sit next to them, to uh, create opportunities for study buddies. Um, you could even create uh, um, specific times where you're going to be in a virtual room or in uh, a room on campus where they can come in and ask questions and study together and uh, you will be available to them, but you know, they, they don't have to necessarily uh, talk to you unless they have specific questions and concerns. Um, another thing you might want to do is thinking about creating cooperative quizzes. So students are going to be uh, either taking a quiz together or they could take quizzes individually, submit them, and then work with students to uh, discuss answers, revise, and resubmit as necessary. So it gives them an opportunity to think through topics, to connect with one another in the classroom, and recognize that other people in the classroom are um, are valuable and are good resources, and it gives them a chance to really talk through things with other people, which again is going to create those connections. Okay, so I have talked on and on, but I would love for you all to uh, to be able to share and to ask questions if they've occurred to you. So. Um, you can either turn on your mic or uh, type in the chat. What are some ways that you created opportunities for belonging or uh, if you have any um, things that you wanna share about the ways that you've experienced belonging as a student or even in your role at NIU, what have uh, what's happened in order for you to feel like you belong or for you to help other people feel like they belong. And if there are specific challenges that you have experienced with uh, students belonging uncertainty and, and what questions you have in general. So I'll give you all, um, I'll, I'll open up the floor. Um, if there are questions or suggestions or um, things that you all want to share, love to hear it. Hi, <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting and I learned a lot. Uh, I think I can uh, really use that when I start teaching in the fall. I wanted to know what you mean by barter board exactly. Oh, barter board. Um, so bartering is essentially uh, trading resources. So exchanging things that are that are valuable that doesn't involve money. 
So uh, creating a space for students to share things that they could uh, trade within class, um, that they could share with other people that would be relevant to class, that would be relevant to uh, working on the skills or thinking about the content for class. Um, I'll share a resource that will go into that a little bit more in depth. Um, does that make sense? Does that help answer? Yeah? Okay. And do you, sorry, I'm asking questions. I, 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 no. We have a bit of time. So, do you yeah. use, yeah. Um, how do you use them? I mean, how do you use or not the social media within your class? to create this sense of belonging? Can you create a sort, encourage them to create a, a group on whatever social media they use for this particular class where they could exchange uh, what you were suggesting? Yeah, um, social media is is a great thing to use for, uh, for creating those connections and especially um, students are just so familiar with it. I, um, I have never asked students to create social media or to like share in those ways because I think that uh, it can create a sense of, uh, well, it, it can create opportunities for people to uh, share personal information that they wouldn't necessarily want to. Um, but using resources that we already have at NIU that are free to students, um, creating a, a Teams group where students could be um, instant messaging each other and putting resources up and, and chatting to each other in like really casual ways, um, that would be helpful. Or using the Yellow Dig platform, which is um, a platform that is, I would say, pretty similar to social media. Like you can do, uh, you can post resources for students, but they can also post their own. They can have conversations. You can use hashtags to be able to find things uh, quickly. Uh, so I'll send out more information about Yellow Dig too. Um, I know not everybody's super familiar with that platform, and I think it's so useful. And students either love it or they hate it. Uh, but I do think it's very similar to like, um, Instagram or to Twitter in the ways that people can have conversations in those spaces and share information. I'm glad that you brought up social media. Um, that's definitely something that is, uh, a great tool to, uh, use to share information. A lot of, uh, people will share information with students through uh, Blackboard announcements. But what happens is if we are constantly sharing Blackboard announcements, students don't read them. Um, it's coming up constantly and they just tune it out. But if there are spaces where we can share things where students can pop in and out as they need and aren't constantly giving them notifications and they're not feeling bogged down, um, that's a really great opportunity to uh, create those connections and allow them to uh, chat with us when they want to, um, because that's a big thing. If they feel like they're being forced to do it, they don't always necessarily want to, you know, um, it's, uh, there's this, what do I want to say? There's a balance between uh, feeling like students uh, get the opportunity to uh, opt in and to connect and everything. And, um, but sometimes they feel like they're being forced, which is uh, going to create tension and possibly isolation. It's just such a, um, a balancing act. And hopefully, if we can show up and be excited about things and show that we're doing this because um, not because I'm trying to force you to do this thing, but because I think this is a great opportunity and have that positive energy, um, then students are more likely to think that we're doing it out of uh, kindness and, uh, and being thoughtful rather than 
Um, I don't know what else to do, so you're going to do group work, and this is the way it's going to be. We've got a few more minutes together. Does anybody else have any questions or anything that they would like to share? Taking time and reflecting on information too is not a bad thing. Um, I love reflective brains. I've got one myself. So sometimes I don't have questions or uh, thoughts um, that are connecting to the ideas until three hours later. And that is totally okay. Um, so I have a couple uh, final thoughts and suggestions. Um, so I've already talked about these things a little bit, but um, we want to make sure that we really are focusing on humanity and creating opportunities for understanding. Um, students don't necessarily need you to be inspirational um, and say, well, I didn't feel like I belonged, but I got it together uh and i did this uh or or talking about how um how incredible uh you are to do something right that's that's not going to be something that they can necessarily connect to or feel like that they're uh they can relate to um so if you can create moments of understanding without trying to uh inspire them um like recognizing that it, it's it's okay for them to just share those thoughts and feelings um don't create uh times or spaces for exclusion um thinking about specific topics and identities uh especially when it comes to uh queer students um and i'm saying that as like the the umbrella term not as like a um a slur but if we're thinking about lgbtq students and we're thinking about like trans and non-binary students uh we want to make sure that we are uh talking about their identities if they relate to the the content as if uh they are in the room because we don't necessarily have that information given to us right um, so make sure that we are creating these spaces of, of, uh, inclusion and not, uh, and not creating distance between humanity and topics. Um, and I also want to recognize that there's this big overlap between teaching methods and, uh, a lot of things that you do that are going to be promoting inclusivity and equity are to also create moments of belonging and connections between your students and yourself. Okay, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Oh, that just stopped the sharing.